Hey and welcome. I'm Hammy and welcome to the unabridged complete timeline and story of Overwatch 2 and Overwatch's world so far. Eight years ago now at BlizzCon 2014, Overwatch was announced to the world. As we stand upon the brink of a new era in Overwatch 2, Overwatch's lore, world building and story have evolved and grown through so many media, in-game voice lines, environmental storytelling and animated shorts, comics, short stories, novels, Twitter teasers, interviews at BlizzCon, Comic-Con panels, in written media and interviews, and so many more. Whether you're new to the game and want to learn about the world, or want a refresher, it can be hard to keep track. So enjoy this video and let me take you on a tour of the story and timeline of Overwatch so far. Now before we start, a note on the method. All Overwatch lore timelining is cited as relative dates. 30 years ago and similar for example from developer interviews, character bios, stories, comics and all of the sources I previously mentioned. So bear in mind that any dates cited are generally relative to each other. There tend to be two points of contention. One of them is the amount of time that Overwatch's general story is set in the future. Now source one for that generally is cited as being this 2014 BlizzCon initial introduction to Overwatch fact. The first uh, inaugural panel for Overwatch. Um, the story takes place something like, it's something like 60 years in the future. Now, whenever you see timelines with definitive dates, people tend to try and work off this. The second thing that can cause variation is how many years have passed in Overwatch's world since the events of this museum trailer, if we deem it to be in roughly 2074. So this video will assume that roughly 60 years in the future is precise, and it's an attempt to be as relatively accurate as possible to all existing sources over the last eight years of Overwatch's existence. However, it's still an interpretation. We've had roughly three different narrative directions and a lot of change, corrections and additions over that time, as any ongoing world and stories do. If you want to dive into any lore asset or topic covered here in detail, well, subscribe to my channel and search. I've covered everything in some form or another over the last eight years. Time codes are in the description below if you want to skip around, settle back and enjoy. From 2014, let's move forward, just 30 years into an Overwatch future. How many people will have been born in that time? What will shape their lives and experiences, their childhoods, and what will they grow to be in that new world? During this time in Overwatch, great intellects have already been born and are in their formative years, ones that will harness gravity, albeit at a cost, like Sebron de Kuiper, engineers like Torbjorn Lindholm, scientists like Moira Odiran, Business minds and sports people even, like Akande Ogundimu. Great fighters like Reinhardt Wilhelm and Anna Amari. And last, but by no means least, leaders with a keen sense in their minds of what justice may entail, like Gabriel Reyes and Jack Morrison. All these figures are born in this time from 2014 onwards and will go and shape the very world and future as the Overwatch world know it. Unlike the 2077s or so of Fallout, for example, in terms of post-apocalyptic, or the cyberpunk future of that 2077 world, the near future of Overwatch is a bright and hopeful one, and dominated by vast and rapid scientific progress in all fields, from medicine to genetics, physics, everything you can name pushes forward at a great pace in a world that can have hovering cars and rail guns genetically engineered super soldiers and hyper-intelligent hamsters and gorillas. With scientific breakthroughs continuing at a great pace on Earth, humanity continued to look to the stars. On the moon, Lucheng Interstellar began construction of what would be a very advanced lunar research facility. As well as sending some of the brightest minds of a generation to commence their studies in space, several animals were also sent for various kinds of testing, but we'll come back to those later in the story. In the field of robotics, one firm pushed ahead way faster than the rest. Omnica Corporation were able to attract some of the brightest minds and talents of a generation, including Singaporean scientist Dr. Mina Liao. Widely considered to be one of the preeminent experts in robotics and AI, Liao firmly believed 
that artificial life and intelligence could transform the lives of humanity for the better. It was in a major part thanks to Liao's work that Omnica Corporation had a major breakthrough in robotic manufacturing. It seemed that with their technology, the world could be on the cusp of entering an economic golden age. Liao's team managed to find ways to make massive factories that could automatically construct machines driven by self-improving software algorithms, and these were rapidly patented and rolled out around the world. Their marketing name was Omniums. Based off the back of Omnica's promises for the technology, Omniums began springing up around the world, with different mechs specialized in different areas. From Nigeria, the notorious OR series was developed. The Bastion was also developed as a peacekeeping design of Omnic. And in other facilities, huge Omnics designed to aid in construction were created, such as the Titan. As with many products and marketing campaigns throughout history, what came next was perhaps not a surprise. The Omniums began to break down. Independent investigations and analysis showed they would never come close to meeting the promises of growth and of output that the corporation had originally made. After investigations took place, Omnica was forcibly dissolved, fraud was uncovered, and around the world, its Omniums shut down. In many timelines, the story would have ended there, with Omnica Corporation another name in the annals of companies that overpromised and underdelivered. However, it was a titanic surprise to the world when suddenly, out of nowhere, the dismantled and defunct facilities woke themselves back up and immediately launched a surprise, sudden and deadly campaign against all of humanity. Across the entire world, the Omnium facilities went rogue and churned out legions upon legions of militarized robots, many based off of the designs that they had been using previously. Omniums and their populations had originally been built to increase manufacturing capability and create prosperity and equality for every economy in the world. Now, these marvels of modern science sought to overthrow the human race, posing one of the greatest threats to the survival of humans since the Cold War of the 20th century. With the rapid technological and scientific process of the past three decades, many countries around the world felt that they were ready and prepared to fight, and each country had their own trademark weapons and signature solutions that they tried to bring to this omnic crisis. From Russia, the Sviatogor mech. These huge, hulking machines were produced by leading weapons manufacturer Volskaya Industries, and Russia for a time had more success than any other country in the world at fighting off the omnic menace. In Germany, they looked to suits of armor, powered and militarized in the Crusader program. In America, scientists had been working on genetic modification techniques for a long time, and when the crisis struck, the Soldier Enhancement Program, a top-secret classified program, was put into action, with military scientists shaping young soldiers into perfect soldiers with superhuman speed, strength, and agility. Many countries around the world had some success, but no single nation, no matter how powerful its military or solutions, could permanently shut down a single Omnium for good. The Omnics were too adaptable. Once the adaptability of robots had been celebrated by humanity, it had now become a tactical nightmare to fight against that no nation had experience of. They had no mercy and they could not be negotiated with. On and on the Omnics came, turning the skies dark with their dropships. As leaders and governments tried and failed to stop the Omnic advance, the United Nations was busy. Under Secretary General Gabriella Darwe formed an international task force called Overwatch. A small and nimble team, its design was to succeed where local armies and forces had failed, striking significant blows against Omnic strongholds and tactical targets. This small experimental group would bring together the best and brightest from around the world. The initial Overwatch strike team in the first Omnic crisis had six members, the first of which was Jack Morrison. Hailing from rural Indiana, a farmer's son, Morrison joined the military at 18 and was soon caught up in the first Omnic crisis, where he volunteered for the Soldier Enhancement Program. It was there that he met Gabriel Reyes. A senior officer to Morrison, Reyes was a hardened and highly respected veteran. He grew up about as far from Indiana as you could get being a policeman from the sprawling urban melting pot of Los Angeles. 
Morrison and Reyes became fast friends, and their decision to join Overwatch together would change the world, both for good and for ill. In Egypt, the local military had had success holding off the Omnics with elite sniper and military units, and it was from those units that Arna Amari joined Overwatch. From Germany, a crusader, Reinhard Wilhelm, although he was not meant to be the original recruit. Reinhardt, a reckless and brave crusader, had fought and trained under Baldrich von Adler, the leader of the crusaders. Thinking himself and his friends invincible and drunk on the feeling of glory, Reinhardt learned his lesson as to how teamwork works and how sacrifice is at the Battle of Eichenwald. His mentor and friend gave up his life so that Reinhardt and his colleagues might live and that the overall mission could be accomplished. No, I'm staying here. But I... Uh, without you... Lieutenant! You took an oath to be a crusader. Thinking of honour and of glory, and of the great honour that it would be to join Overwatch, as Baldrick had said, Reinhardt decided to go in his place. From Sweden, Torbjorn Lindholm, an engineer of note and notoriety, Torbjorn had designed weapon systems used by countries around the world. His belief that technology should serve a better vision for humanity contradicted that of his employers, who wanted to use AI and network computer intelligence in controlling many of his systems and designs. Torbjorn had a deep mistrust of this, and many of his peers wrote this off as paranoia, but when the Omnic crisis arrived, his worst fears were realized. Last but not least, the team was rounded out by Mina Liao. Feeling guilt and responsibility for her part in what the Omnics had unleashed upon the world, Liao used her expertise to help Overwatch try and stop some of her creation. They had every reason to doubt me. You should join us. But I helped create the Omnics. And who better to help us fight them? Although leadership of Overwatch fell to Reyes initially, Morrison would have a greater impact on the group over the long term. He brought out the best in people around him and helped mould Overwatch's diverse and sometimes conflicting agents, personalities and opinions into a cohesive and deadly fighting force. In their unity, they found the strength to defeat the robots, work with local teams and militaries around the world and end the Omnic crisis. In highly secretive missions, the team targeted Omnic command and control protocols, and after great sacrifice and heroism in a series of dangerous raids, the Omnic armies fell inert. For Morrison, the UN rewarded him for his contributions by making him Overwatch's first official commander. With Reyes being passed over in the process, some say this created a rift between the two men that would never fully heal. As the world rebuilt and attempted to recover, Devastation lay in its wake, and a great cost of the Omnic Crisis was shattered families and orphans around the world. In Switzerland, one such young victim of the Omnic Crisis was Angela Ziegler, having lost both of her parents to the war. Ziegler would be lucky in finding somewhat of an adoptive family in that of the Lindholms when they crossed paths later on. However, others weren't so fortunate. In Haiti, Jean-Baptiste Augustin, was one of the 30 million children orphaned by the Omnic Crisis. And in Mexico, a young girl, Olivia Colomar, with no parents, survived by utilizing her natural gifts with hacking and computers. As the world attempted to clear up from the devastation caused by the years of war, not all Omnics were inert. Some groups of outcast robots experienced what they described as a spiritual awakening. Abandoning their pre-programmed lives, some of them established a commune deep in the Himalayas, and after many years of meditation, they believed that they were more than AI, and that, like humans, they had come to possess the essence of what they believed to be a soul. The monks, led by the enigmatic, if slightly dogmatic, robot known as Mondata, sought to try and heal the wounds in society caused by the Omnic Crisis, and bring robots and humans back together in society. Their message was embraced in time by millions around the world, and they became global celebrities. One monk, Zenyata, disagreed with this, believing that the way to repair the problems between humans and Omnics was not through teaching directly, but through connection, engagement, and understanding. 
Any war often pushes technological advancements forward, and the Omnic Crisis was no different. The Vishkar Corporation of Southern India, straight after the Omnic Crisis, had to begin a laborious process of creating new, self-sustaining cities to house the nation's displaced population. One such city became the jewel in their crown, Utopia, made using radical new hard light technology, enabling architects to shape cities, utilities, streets and more in the blink of an eye. Few people were capable of doing this light bending and this created opportunities for the gifted and able, including a young Satya Vaswani. Plucked from extreme poverty, she was placed in the care of Vishkar's architect academy, never to return home. Satya preferred to weave her constructs in the motions of a dance of her homeland rather than more procedural, mechanical constructions and quickly rose to the top of her class. One of the heads of Vishkar, Sanjay Korpal, picked her out and chose her for greater, in his opinion, things. Due to his success, after the Omnic Crisis, Overwatch experienced a huge rise in global prominence. New funding and resources gave the now public organisation far-reaching global influence and the world celebrated Overwatch as heroes, but none so more than Jack Morrison. Wherever a recruitment poster was seen, Morrison became the face of the organization, a symbol of hope and promise for the world. From King's Row to Cairo, to the sweltering night markets of Bangkok. As Strike Commander, Morrison envisioned a bright new future for humanity, and under his leadership, Overwatch kept peace globally, became an engine for innovation and made advances in scientific fields as varied as space exploration and medical research. However, even as Overwatch grew in power, he stayed dedicated to the people around him, with Arna Ramari serving as his second in command. Morrison trained new agents, instilling in them Overwatch's noble goals and ideals, including Vivian Chase. Known as her coal sign, Sojourn, Vivian was a Canadian Special Forces soldier who teamed up with Overwatch during the Omnic Crisis. Starting out of necessity in her childhood, Sojin had a lot of cybernetic upgrades in her life, but eventually decided to opt in for them when she was in the military to become the most effective fighter that she could be. Sojin and other Overwatch operatives were needed as there were still dangers in the world for Overwatch to face. In roundabout 2051, Operation White Dome saw Anna, Reinhardt, Torbjorn and an agent called Emre dispatched to deal with a pocket of Omnic resistance. The team were ambushed under heavy fire, leading Torbjorn to lose an arm. However, Reinhardt managed to save his life. In a somewhat irritated letter to his wife, Torbjorn notes that he is okay and hopefully will make it home for the birth of their latest child. He did, however, mention that Reinhardt wished to have the privilege of naming said child in exchange for saving his life. Torbjorn hopes that Reinhardt will pick a good name. And indeed, he didn't do too badly with Brigitte. As society struggled to get back to normal in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, some areas never really saw a true restoration of law and order. In the American Southwest, a new gang emerged, the Deadlock Rebels. Founded by Elizabeth Caledonia Ash, partially as a replacement for the family who were often absent on her when she was a child, and partially as a gang of thieves, they made a great name for themselves with audacious heists and capers evading capture wherever they went. Among the founding members of the gang was an expert marksman and an outlaw. His name? Cole Cassidy. Under the auspices of Cassidy and Ash, the gang ran rampant until eventually Overwatch had to step in to sort out law and order in the area. Reyes managed to take down the gang and capturing Cassidy gave him a choice. Either rot in jail or join Blackwatch, the new covert ops division of Overwatch that Reyes was running. Cassidy, seizing the chance to not be in jail, accepted, and Ash and the rest of the gang, including her Nick Butler Bob, lived to thieve another day. Even after the Omnic Crisis, some areas of the world remained forever scarred. In Australia, government officials gifted the Australian Omnium and the surrounding area to the Omnics that had nearly destroyed their country, hoping to establish a long-term peace. This displaced a number of Australian locals, including Mako Rutledge and a large number of outback residents, survivalists, solar farmers, and people who just wanted to be left alone. Resentful and angry at their displacement, they formed an organization known as the Australian Liberation Front, and in increasingly violent encounters, the fighting eventually culminated 
in the rebels sabotaging the fusion core of the Australian Omnium, causing a meltdown, destroying it and irradiating the surrounding area with radiation and scattered metal. A martial and chaotic society, the Junkers would often hold events called the Reckoning, where, in theory, if someone made it that far with a good fight, they could become ruler of the entire place, but only if they beat the current king. The ruler of Junkertown was all-powerful within the city's walls, and, in one particular judgment, Odessa Des Stone was thrown out of the city along with her family by King Mason Howell. Having fought the world apparently since 17, according to her origin story, Stone went on to become a legend as a wastelander and vowed her eventual return to Junkertown for revenge against Howell. For decades, as Overwatch grew, they made global stability their mission and the world was happy to have them. Rogue Omnics, terrorism, warmongering dictators and more, none of them could stand for long against such a capable and dedicated force. As well as heroic rescue operations and rebuilding initiatives, Overwatch also continued pioneering science to eradicate epidemics, reverse ecological damage, and develop new breakthroughs in medical care. It was round about this time when Mercy joined Overwatch. Angela Ziegler, now a prominent head of surgery at the University Hospital in Switzerland, was a published expert in nanobiology. Jack Morrison, reading her paper, invited her to the headquarters and asked her to become Overwatch's head of medical research. Ziegler, a little cautious by nature, probably from Torbjorn's advice, stewardship and guardianship, said that she would, but only if her applications of her work could be focused on the civilian and the practical. She didn't want any of her work to be used in terms of putting Overwatch agents in harm's way. During the two decades of peace that Overwatch brought to the world after the first Omnic crisis, a whole generation of people grew up seeing them as heroes of ideals of humanity. Tracer, born in the UK. Farah, growing up with her mum and around Overwatch heroes, wanted to join them and emulate them one day. And of course, Brigitte, growing up in Torbjorn's workshop, learning her skills, and with Reinhardt often not far away, filling her head with tales of glory. Over in Haiti, Baptiste, inspired by Overwatch, would join the Caribbean Coalition as a medic. Meanwhile, up in space, the Horizon Lunar Colony was established and exploring various scientific paths for humanity's renewed exploration of space. Among its residents were several animals, a group of genetically enhanced gorillas, and also some smaller animals too, but two of them will concern us mainly here. One gorilla showed such rapid brain development from the therapy that he was taken under the wing of one of the leading scientists, a Dr. Harold Winston. Passing his days assisting with experiments, he was able to learn scientific principles from the doctor and he was inspired by his tales of human glory and ingenuity. Dreaming of the endless possibilities that awaited him there, the young gorilla quickly grew up into a subject that we know as Winston. There were some exceptions to the gorilla testing, including a particular hamster who got the name Hammond. He grew in intelligence and ability in a similar way to the gorillas, although he didn't appear to have speaking capability. Much to the puzzlement of the scientists, he'd frequently escape around the base, and although the scientists didn't know what he was up to, he was actually training himself as a mechanic, and these skills would soon become very useful. The colony was thrown into chaos when some of the gorillas, getting increasingly agitated, rose up against the scientists and took control, potentially locking them in an airlock and taking over the base. Winston didn't want a part of this and made a plan to escape to Earth, and Hammond sensed his opportunity too. As Winston's rocket took off, Winston wanted no part of this, and Hammond also sensed an opportunity to escape. As Winston's makeshift spacecraft took off towards Earth, Hammond built a capsule too and secretly hitched it to Winston. As Winston came back into Earth's atmosphere, he landed on Earth safely and found a home with Overwatch, an organisation that represented everything he had come to admire about humans. Hammond, however, broke off in a different direction and landed in the wasteland of the Australian outback. Coming upon Junkertown, Hammond modified his pod to enter the mech battle arena of the scrapyard, and Wrecking Ball became a champion, although his identity remained a mystery to all for a while. 
even with all of the triumphs and progress that Overwatch and the world made, after nearly two decades of peace, Overwatch never had a shortage of critics. Even in its best times, many voices questioned whether the agency had too broad a mission and whether it should be restricted and insisting that such a powerful, talented and funded group of individuals needed careful oversight. The grand goals of Morrison, coupled with the no doubt brilliant individuals and access to funding that Overwatch had, meant that the balance between freedom to act and very, very tight oversight, between personal good judgment and ambition, was often a very, very fine line. Gabriel Reyes, commanding Blackwatch at this time, had a lot of autonomy and it has to be said trust from Morrison to pursue his own recruitment decisions and questions around mission tactics and policy. One such decision was the a scientist previously on the up, Udiran had made waves when she published a very controversial paper detailing a method for making custom genetic programs, altering DNA at a cellular level. Although it seemed like a promising step towards several medical advances, her peers showed considerable dissent. Some people thought it was dangerous, with ethical shortfalls. And with her reputation seriously called into question, Odirin received a lifeline that, like many others, came from Gabriel Reyes. Just as in the past Cassidy had had an opportunity to turn his life around, and in the future Genji would too, so Odirin received an offer. Overwatch's covert ops division Blackwatch would support her with her work and funding, albeit in the shadows. Her employment was kept a closely guarded secret. While Overwatch took a gamble on very, very talented, if controversial individuals behind the scenes, even some of its more public and well-known figures were pursuing their own slightly questionable research. Dr. Mina Liao still dreamed of improving on her original Omnic designs and hoping that she could bring a better Omnic solution and Omnic support for humanity. What she created, in the end, was a multi-role adaptive robot that could learn different functions from medical support to construction, but had very big limits on its independent decision making. There was a learning at least from the first Omnic crisis there. Echo, as the robot was dubbed, had many layers of fail-safes, protection and security to keep it under control, and was used on test missions alongside Overwatch, but Overwatch leadership was reluctant to put it into full service. Behind the scenes, Liao had programmed Echo with a powerful general artificial intelligence that learned by observation. And after thousands of hours in the scientist's presence, many of her behaviors, including her patterns of speech, had even been adopted and perfectly replicated by the Echo robot. One of the few people to know the truth of this was Liao's handler, Blackwatch agent Cole Cassidy. At times, he had guarded the scientist and had seen the development in progress. Outside of Overwatch's behind-the-scenes research, there were more rumors circling. Black Ops missions, carrying out tasks like kidnapping and assassination, were initially dismissed by the public as paranoid fantasies. As Overwatch, swelling and growing as an organization, tried to grapple with its internal direction and increased mandate, the world itself was beginning to suffer some of its own problems. Strange weather phenomena had been surfacing at various points around the world, and the EcoPoint initiative from Overwatch was looking to monitor this. At EcoPoint Antarctica, with a concerning storm approaching, the team, with concerns over supplies, power and their safety, decided to try and use cryostasis pods to ride out the temporary weather conditions, including one May. Although Overwatch was involved in a lot of peacekeeping and support around the world, it couldn't be everywhere at once, and there was an increasing influence of gangs and growth of criminal organizations, including in Mexico. After Sombra was taken in by Los Muertos, she aided in a revolution and push against the government. Becoming overconfident perhaps in her skills, she was caught unprepared when she stumbled into the web of what she deemed to be a global conspiracy, Scared that her life was in danger and that her security was compromised, she deleted all traces of her identity and went into hiding, resolving to come back. Elsewhere in the world, certain criminal organizations had remained unchecked and Overwatch did try and take steps against these. In Hanamura, Japan, Sohiro Shimada, head of the Shimada criminal syndicate, is assassinated by long-term rivals, the Hashimoto clan. As is tradition, eldest son Hanzo takes over as the new head of the clan, and as his first task, he was directed by clan elders to straighten out the frivolities of his younger brother Genji. 
Although the two had grown up side by side, including their tutelage with Asa Yamagami, the swordmaster and ninja who served their family, Genji had less responsibilities and a more frivolous childhood and life. Rather than show any interest in the family's illegal business, he excelled and enjoyed his ninja training, but preferred a more playboy lifestyle. Trying to sort him out, Hanzo demanded that Genji took more of a role in the empire, and Genji refused. The tension between the brothers built to a violent confrontation that left Genji on the verge of death. Overwatch had been monitoring the situation and swooped in and offered Genji a deal. A rebuilt body in exchange for his help. Accepting, he was put through an extensive process of cyberization, enhancing his natural speed, agility and abilities. Setting about the task of dismantling his family's criminal empire, Genji struggled to come to terms with his new cybernetic nature, and this anger fueled him in a lot of his early missions. Working as part of Blackwatch, it's very possible that Genji's mission, and indeed Overwatch's incursion into Japan, was neither known about initially, nor sanctioned by the Japanese government. In the Uprising comic, when Morrison is behind a desk with all kinds of bad press on the wall behind him, we see that Blackwatch are under scrutiny after a complaint from the Japanese government. Now, we don't know this precisely, but it's quite possible that this could tie to the decision and mission to try and take down the Shimada clan and the resulting trouble that was caused. Ultimately, the Hashimoto clan come and take over Kanazaka and Hanamura, and we learn that Asa Yamagami, the previous Shimada clan swordmaster, has been pressed into their service also. The clan take her husband Toshiro, the ex-swordsmith of the Shimada hostage, and we learn about this more closer to the present day. As time passed, additional controversies seemed to come to light, rumours spread, and problems increased around the world, Overwatch found criticism harder and harder to shrug off. The fact that the agency seemed to be tone deaf to public concerns didn't help. Controversial missions started to stoke outrage until it reached a fever pitch, and ultimately, some of Overwatch's most famous and celebrated agents were forced to retire in disgrace. If that had been the end of it, many might have accepted these steps as unavoidable signs of an aging and bloated bureaucracy, suffering under monolithic leadership that needed a change in direction and new ideas. However, to some, the worst was yet to come. As Overwatch struggled with these various issues, a series of failed operations and incidents would put the organization under ever-increasing pressure, leading up to a catastrophic climax. Eight years before the present day of the museum trailer or so, Overwatch was under direct attack from Talon. One of its enemies was growing bolder and had targeted them in multiple cities across the globe. As Blackwatch established a new facility in Rome, Gerard Lacroix, Overwatch agent and husband of Amélie Lacroix, the famous Parisian ballet dancer, met with Rares and Casti to discuss what they could do about the situation. However, unbeknownst to Lacroix, Talon had snuck a bomb into the base and caused several deaths injuring many others, including Lacroix himself. Overwatch believed the perpetrator to be Antonio Bartolotti, a known talent associate and a businessman with high-ranking connections in the Italian government. Morrison and Reyes greatly debate as to what the best solution is, and with Reyes believing that the usual official channels won't work due to Bartolotti's connections, Morrison gives plausible deniability and covertly sanctions Reyes to do what he thinks is right, letting him have the final decision. Pulling together a Blackwatch strike team of himself, Moira, Cassidy and Genji, Reyes goes to Rialto to hit Bartolotti and try to extract him from his stronghold. However, on the spot, as the mission goes wrong, Reyes makes a decision. On the spur of the moment, enraged, instead of taking in Antonio as previously planned, he executes him. As the mission goes wrong, the entire Blackwatch strike team have to shoot their way out of Talon's hideout, with Genji, Moira and Cassidy all discussing with each other the potential implications of this action. Although the team managed to get away, cover was blown, and the incident both created terrible press for Overwatch, as well as revealing the existence of Blackwatch in the first place, for the first time in the organization's history, adding to the press and public opinion problems that Morrison had. To make matters worse, Moira O'Deeran's work and association with Overwatch was also uncovered following the Venice incident, as it came to be known. 
and many high-ranking Overwatch officials disavowed all knowledge of her affiliation with them. At some point after this, Moira would leave Overwatch and Blackwatch. She was offered a job as Minister of Genetics in Oasis, a haven city for science without certain rules and restrictions somewhere out in the desert. In the years after leaving Overwatch, Moira also gets associations with Talon and eventually will take a seat on their inner council. Following the Venice incident, Blackwatch, according to Overwatch and Morrison, was officially suspended from active duty, although they would still be covertly in operation in the years to come. After the death of Antonio, Talon's head was not cut off. Instead, power machinations and moves occurred within the organisation. A new leader, Viali, came forward. Talon, as a fairly loose organisation, albeit with an inner council, had plenty of different people with plenty of different motivations working for it. One such agent, Akande Ogundimu, was able, during this time, to overcome his mentor, Akinje Adeyemi, and take on the moniker of Doomfist. Believing in strength and the improvement of humanity through conflict, Doomfist's more moral-of-a-sort ideology contrasted strongly with Viali's, who attempted to put the organisation more on the path towards financial control, power and gain. After the events of Venice, the public heard more stories of assassination, coercion, kidnapping, torture and worse, and governments called on the United Nations to shut down the aggressive and repeated violations of many countries' sovereignty. As if this weren't enough, some of Overwatch's scientific projects were also floundering or having difficulties. One such project was the Slipstream Project. Lena Oxton was the youngest person ever inducted into Overwatch's experimental flight program. Known for her fearless piloting skills, she was testing a teleporting fighter prototype, the Slipstream. However, during its first flight, the teleportation matrix malfunctioned and it disappeared. Months later, Oxton returned but her molecules had been desynchronized from the flow of time. This condition, known as chronal disassociation, meant that without help she was a living ghost, disappearing for hours and days at a time, and often unable to maintain physical form. Trace's case seemed hopeless until a scientist named Winston designed the chronal accelerator, a device capable of keeping Tracer anchored in the present. Also, Tracer could control her own time, speeding it up and slowing it down at will even being able to recall a short period of time after taking actions. During this time frame, it's quite likely that Overwatch suffered another huge personal and organisational setback, the death of Gerard Lacroix. Although he managed to survive Talon's attack on the Blackwatch Rain base, unbeknownst to him, there was a threat much more concealed, unexpected and closer to home. After several unsuccessful attempts to directly eliminate Gerard, Talon decided to change its focus to his more vulnerable wife, Emily. Kidnapped, Talon subjected her to an intense program of neural reconditioning, breaking her will, suppressing her own personality, and reprogramming her as a sleeper agent. She was eventually found by Overwatch agents after being kidnapped, apparently none the worse for wear, and returned to her normal life. Two weeks later, however, she killed Gerard in his sleep and disappeared. Returning to Talon, they completed the process of turning her into another living weapon. Given extensive training in the covert arts, her physiology was also altered, slowing her heart, turning her skin cold, and numbing her ability to experience human emotion. Amélie, the famous Parisian ballet dancer, was gone. Now, all that remained was Widowmaker. As Overwatch was recovering from the events of Retribution and Venice, another problem emerged in London. In the UK, Omnic and human tensions had always been high since the first Omnic crisis, with many Omnics in London, in the King's Row area, living in an area called the Underworld, effectively being ghettoised underneath the city. Just as the building of a new home, Turing Green for the Omnics in London, was looking to potentially help mend bridges, the Omnic terrorist organisation Null Sector struck. Assaulting the city, they took hostages, the Omnic spiritual leader Takata Mondata, as well as the Mayor of London and a large number of civilians. With violence and death tolls mounting, Overwatch was surveying the situation. With Cassidy on the ground in London, providing reconnaissance and intel, out of the knowledge of Arna Amari and potentially Jock Morrison as well. Given that the UK government and Prime Minister had specifically requested that Overwatch did not get involved, Morrison is conflicted on what to do. Watching Tracer in action in training against Genji, 
Morrison decides that really he can't get involved. He is visited by Tracer, who reminds him that one of the reasons she left the flight test program and decided to begin training as an Overwatch agent was because she wanted to make the world a better place, and that started in her home of London. Deciding to make the call anyway, Morrison decides to dispatch a strike team, led by Reinhardt Wilhelm, with Mercy as medical support, Torbjorn from a technical perspective, and Tracer as their local expert. Their plan was simple. Land, turn off the air defences, make sure they could then take a dropped payload and blow open the doors of the underworld where the hostages were being held, and rescue the hostages. Although the mission was a success, Overwatch still had to deal with the question as to why they'd violated the sovereignty of another independent country against their wishes again. With Talon's operations extending around the globe, Overwatch was under more and more pressure. Morrison, in the events of Legacy, the comic, led a team to extract a group of scientists that Talon was holding hostage, potentially in Poland, judging by some of the after-reports as to Arna Romari's condition. While covering the team, Anna reflects on her attitude towards missions and how she is losing the appetite for the violence and death that her job entails. As the team comes under fire from an elite sniper, position unknown, Anna tries to get a bead on where the fire is coming from. Getting the upper hand in the duel and still contemplating what her attitude is towards death and destruction, Anna manages to clip the sniper's helmet, revealing the sniper to be none other than Amélie Lacroix. As in the moment, Anna hesitates, piecing together that Amélie must have been responsible for the death of Gerard, Amélie gets off a single shot. Shooting Anna in the head and destroying her eye, she is left reeling on the floor. And in assets and comics released around Anna's launch as a hero, we discovered that she survived, she was kept in medical care, and then afterwards decided to go into hiding. To Overwatch, her colleagues, her husband Sam, and her daughter Faria. Anna had no more fight left in her, and the world considered her to be dead. While still reeling from the potential loss of Anna Amari, Overwatch's work continued, and against a backdrop of Reyes and Morrison arguing over combat operations, the team swung into action in Havana, Cuba. As Hurricane Ferdinand was advancing on the island, Sojourn, now working as Deputy Strike Commander in Anna Amari's absence, commanded a strike team of Winston, Tracer, Genji and Mercy to go and try and capture Talon's lead financier, an Omnic known as Maximilian. Initially hitting the rum distillery that Maximilian uses as a front for Talon operations and money laundering, the team chase Maximilian through the streets of Havana until they corner him attempting to flee by helicopter from his coastal fortress hideout. Cornered by Genji at Swordpoint with no other way out, Maximilian proposes to negotiate, asking the squad what they would like. Mercy simply requests for an introduction, entreating the Omnic as to whose audience she would like to have. We see in a post credits sequence that Doomfist in Egypt addresses another Omnic, or so it seems, commending the Omnic's desire to fight for the freedom of Omnics, but dismissing it as a doomed attempt and instead offers his partnership in an enterprise yet to be confirmed. Off the back of this intelligence, three weeks later in Singapore, we see in the initial events of Doomfist's origin trailer, the resulting conflict. Genji, Tracer and Winston engage in a battle with Doomfist across Singapore's high skyline to try and bring him to justice. We see Doomfist's calculating nature, his intelligence and his martial arts past. He doesn't strike blindly, he times his hits, breaks Tracer's chronal accelerator with one grab and leaves Genji hit in the dust before Winston, enraged at the thought of his friends in danger, goes into a primal rage and takes Doomfist into custody. Put on trial and imprisoned in a high security facility, Doomfist at one point is visited by Reyes, who gives him food for thought on why he is actually fighting and what the nature of justice is. In the future, this is the connection and the discussion that will lead Reyes partially to Doomfist to try and answer the questions he has following the disastrous events to come. In the events of Storm Arising, we also hear in voice lines and interactions between Mercy and Winston that Lucheng Interstellar is in the process of building a new space station. 
Now, although it's not confirmed in law, it's very possible that Sebrin de Kuiper's research into graphitic theory was actually culminating on this space station, the space station that is mentioned in his bio. The black hole experiment he ran went horribly wrong, causing extensive psychological damage to him, but actually gave him the ability to, along with his various suits and pieces of technology, manipulate gravity. Believing that he had glimpsed the universe and thinking that he was able to harness the harness, the, the mentally unwell and quite dangerous de Kuiper was quarantined away in a top secret government facility where seemingly he would spend the rest of his days. By round about the year 2068 to 2069, even though Overwatch had some field successes, the pressure was becoming too much and a special UN committee launched a lengthy and highly secretive investigation into all of the claims surrounding the organization. Eventually, this inquiry would lead to the dismantling of Overwatch. However, before all of that could happen, a massive tragedy rocked Overwatch and was the death knell of the troubled organization. As the UN investigation proceeded, the Overwatch Swiss headquarters was destroyed in an apparent accident. Among the apparent casualties were Morrison and Reyes in a huge explosion. At the time, the UN said that there was no foul play behind the accident. However, press and various sources since have questioned as to whether that a conflict between Morrison and Reyes in some form or another was the ultimate cause of this tragic explosion. Some press reports with access to various interviews and UN files said that potentially a rebellion tore the group apart from within, with Morrison on one side trying to hold Overwatch together and Reyes being on the other side with an unknown agenda. It was a fight or a battle somehow between these groups that triggered an explosion. Now, whether this is true or not, some Overwatch agents did comment on the conflict between the two. After Morrison's promotion to Strike Commander, his relationship with Reyes changed, Dr. Angela Ziegler said. The tension became more pronounced as time went on. I tried to mend things, we all did. Sometimes when the closest bonds break, all you can do is pray that you stay out of the crossfire. Whatever the truth behind this incident, and we still don't know the precise events of it until this day, little could remain hidden for Overwatch. Everything to do with its shadowy operations, of its Blackwatch operations became out and known, and even the biggest defenders inside the organization bowed to the truth and called for its disillusion. An international justice commission called several Overwatch members in front of it to testify, including Mercy, as we'd previously mentioned, and Sojourn in her new capacity as acting commander following the disappearance, presumed death, of Morrison and of Reyes. The United Nations could do nothing but shut down Overwatch. Few people at the time doubted it was the right call. At the time, the world had actually never been more peaceful on the surface, and many people thought that Really, the biggest threat to global stability and growth was, in spite of incidents recently, Overwatch itself. Although the world may have seemed peaceful to some, given the Null Sector invasion and fight in London, and given the various threats that we know existed, there was certainly a need for Overwatch, but it was either perhaps a victim of its own success, of the lofty but good ambitions and sometimes hubris and decision-making of its commanders-in-chief. After the dismantling of Overwatch, the international community put the Petrus Act into place. This law dismantled Overwatch and stopped any former agents of the organization and other people from taking peacekeeping actions as part of Overwatch or any similar organized body. In the immediate aftermath of the organization disbanding, both its agents and the world adapted. Mercy and Sojourn both left the organization. Cassidy kept his head low, given that he was wanted both for crimes as part of Blackwatch and for his previous crimes potentially as part of the Deadlock Gang, there wasn't really a way out for him without the protection that Overwatch and Blackwatch provided. Genji had potentially left the organization a little earlier. Still struggling to come to terms with his part cybernetic nature, even after some of his discussions with and mentoring from Sojin, he wandered until he ran into Zenyatta, becoming a disciple and student of his in Nepal. In a previous attack on an Overwatch facility, probably before the downfall of the organization, Dr. Mina Liao sadly passed away. Her creation and her legacy, Echo, is secured by the military and is put into storage. At some point between here and the events of Reunion, the cinematic, Cassidy is able to acquire her activation key, potentially from Sombra. 
but we'll come to that in a bit. With the military and peacekeeping presence of Overwatch absent in the world, there was a lot of work that needed doing, and there was the rise of several private security and military companies to fill this void, including Helix Securities. Discouraged by her mother throughout her life from joining Overwatch, now there was no opportunity, Faria Amari at some point joined Helix Securities and worked in Egypt, helping to keep the peace. As many of these companies tried to take opportunity in the fact that Overwatch wasn't there, so did other more nefarious organisations. By this time, Olivia Colomar had re-emerged as Sombra, upgraded and determined to find out the truth behind the conspiracy she believed she had uncovered. Launching ever more audacious strings of hacks, she got no shortage of admirers for her skills and targets, including eventually attracting the eye of talent. Joining the organization's ranks, Sombra was still able to pursue her own agenda, including contributing to massive cyber attacks, including trying to expose the corruption of President Guillermo Portero in Mexico and that of the Lumerico Corporation, particularly in Dorado, in the events of the long-running Sombra ARG that preceded Sombra's launch. Although Overwatch had fallen and was no longer an organization, Doomfist still remained incarcerated. However, he was trying to find agents to operate for him while he was still in prison. Just a year after the events of the Swiss HQ falling, Reaper's Code of Violence short story summarizes that Gabriel Reyes, struggling with his emotions, had been rescued. Somehow finding himself under the medical treatment of Moira, she effectively, according to her theories, gave him a treatment that was the only way to save his life. However, given that it was a substance that was very, very similar, if not the same, to the one used on him in the Soldier Enhancement Program, seemed to have the unfortunate side effect of making it harder and harder for Reyes not only to regain and hold on to his sanity, but to keep control of and coalesce himself from his vapor state into a solid concrete form. Wondering if he'll ever see his family again, and if they'll accept who he's become, Reyes, along with Sombra, take on a mission to target a black site facility. In that mission, they kill a lot of guards with Reyes almost reveling in his mission and quest, and at the end, they rescue Sigmund de Kuiper, now known as Subject Sigma. As Reyes leaves the facility as Widowmaker and a Talon Strike team come in to clear up afterwards, he looks at the chaos and the carnage that he's caused and mentally believes that there is no way back for him. Talon and Doomfist will provide the avenue and the equipment that he needs to try in his mind to bring what he sees as justice to the world. De Kuiper, under the care of Talon, slowly works to try and gain mastery over both his powers, the scientific facts he's discovered, and put together his shattered mind. However, it seems that Moira is potentially experimenting on him, but Sombra, in interruptions from Overwatch 2, is trying to look out for him. Having flourished in the aftermath of the Omnic Crisis, the Vishkar Corporation now is expanding elsewhere around the world. Attempting to pitch for a construction development in Rio de Janeiro, it's turned down, and Satya Viswani, now Symmetra, an agent of Vishkar, is sent in to try and help with the negotiations. Using her teleporter and infiltrating a local developer and architect's office, she finds nothing that would actually help Vishkar in terms of corporate espionage. However, as she's on her way out, Sanjay detonates explosives in the building showing that he's determined to make sure that Vishkar win the contract by any means necessary. Local favelas in the area take the brunt of the destruction, and Symmetra, using her abilities, attempts to try and protect and save some of the people affected. Months later, when the new redevelopment is finally unveiled, Symmetra has doubts as to Sanjay's claims that indeed Vishkar are actually making the world a better place if the fire and the destruction he caused is actually a part of it. During this time, Roadhog and Junkrat are mulling around Junkertown in the events of the Wasted Land comic. Reflecting on the strange nature of Junker society, Roadhog is in a bar when he overhears Junkrat in some trouble with the Queen's enforcers. Apparently Junkrat has found the location of a secret treasure of some value and the Queen would like to know what and where it is. 
Saying that he'll give a share of the spoils to anyone who helps him, Roadhog decides to help Junkrat, not just for the treasure, 50% as they negotiate at the end of the story, but also because he feels that he's a character that shouldn't be suppressed. Around about four years before the present day of the museum trailer and Overwatch's introduction, Baptiste decides to leave Talon on a particular mission to try and extract a criminal boss from a safe house. The mission rapidly gets out of hand with violence towards civilians and looting, causing several innocents to get caught in the crossfire. Not 100% happy with Talon's morals to start with, Baptiste does a runner. However, one of his squad mates, Malga, allows him to escape. Roaming around under the radar in a similar fashion to Cassidy, Baptiste uses his medical skills whilst attempting while he can to send money home to a clinic in Port-au-Prince. At some point during this period, he actually runs into Mercy at a site she's working on in Venezuela. After working together for about a week, as detailed in Baptiste's short story, What You Left Behind, Baptiste moves on. However, he is struck by Mercy's professionalism and in the future will try and help her out of a sticky situation. Elsewhere in the world, Torbjorn is traveling and trying to make amends and be responsible for his omnics and creations. Traveling to Kajikistan, he's working on disabling and destroying a rogue titan that appears to be run by someone who he knows from the past, an engineer named Sven. An ex-colleague of Torbjorn's, potentially from the Ironclad Guild, Sven says that his use and demonstration of force of the titan against a corrupt dictatorship, in his opinion, is potentially a force for good. Torbjorn believes that he's nothing but, in his words, a sleazebag profiteer and takes him out. We catch up with Reinhardt in the events of Dragon Slayer, where him and Brigitte in their beaten down bus travel around Europe trying to fight against injustice where they find it. Going into a local town, they take on a gang of thugs known as the Dragons, with Reinhardt's beaten armor still being kept in service by Brigitte. Meanwhile in America, a mysterious masked vigilante known as Soldier 76 emerges. Going across the US, he strikes at Watchpoint Grand Mesa, stealing a prototype pulse rifle before hitting some high profile robberies and attacks dominating the news. Apparently bombing financial offices and corporate institutions, Soldier 76 also hit out at a number of former Overwatch bases. The connection between all of the targets appeared to be to do with Overwatch. Soldier 76 stole valuable technology, and many people in the media speculated as to whether, given that in some certain security footage he appeared to be the same height and proportions, that Jack Morrison was in fact not dead. In the events of the animated short Hero, Jack Morrison, Soldier 76, arrives in Dorado, either potentially investigating the Los Muertos street gang, or perhaps the connection between President Guillermo Portero and the somewhat suspicious Lumerico power and wider organization. If he's busting gang activity, he manages to catch a bunch of gang members in the middle of potentially smuggling weapons. We follow the story in the short of a young girl called Alejandra. She gets caught in the violence. However, Soldier 76 makes sure that she gets out okay. Looking at the tattered example of an Overwatch poster still on the wall, Alejandra goes home to her mum and is once again inspired by the thought that there may still be heroes in the world. From this point onwards in Overwatch's story, the official media, comics, animated shorts and similar follow several storylines which are intertwined with each other and some of which take place at a similar time. We'll go through them in terms of following the story threads and try and point out if they could be happening at the same time not in the precise consecutive order that we're covering them here. Heading to Cairo in the events of the Old Soldiers comic, Morrison is potentially on the trail of a local mercenary known as Hakim. However, pausing in a street, he sees a wanted poster. Hakim is offering a bounty on a mysterious hooded figure. Assaulting Hakim's compound, Soldier overhears a conversation between Hakim and a mysterious stranger mentioning Sombra and hoping that they can get something useful out of particular information. Fighting everyone in the compound trying to get Hakim to show himself, Morrison is ambushed by none other than Reaper, aka Gabriel Reyes. In what seems to be the two's first meeting since the events of that fateful day at the Swiss headquarters and when Overwatch was dissolved, Reyes seems to be looking for revenge 
and gets the better of Morrison and is seemingly about to kill him until a dart comes from on high and the mysterious hooded stranger from the wanted poster intervenes on Morrison's side. Firing darts into Reaper that appear to harm him whilst healing Morrison with a long range shot. The tables of the fight turn and the mask slips from the stranger to reveal it to be none other than Arna Amari. With Rares fighting both of his former colleagues, he is outnumbered, tripped, and his mask is temporarily removed, with Anna being shocked by what she sees. He did this to me, Anna. They left me to become this thing, he says, before he disappears and materialises elsewhere. As Anna and Morrison catch up, Morrison confesses that he was looking for her, Anna decides that Morrison needs someone to temporarily watch his back, and the two decide to collaborate for now. In the events of the short story Bastet, directly following this comic, Arna and Morrison catch up a big bunch, including as to the details behind Arna's going missing, following the events of Legacy, of Morrison and what he's been up to in the time after the fall of Overwatch. The two settle on an accord. Morrison will help Arna with her problem with Hakim and sorting out Cairo, and then the two after that will go after Reaper. Around 2074 to 2075, depending on your relative dating, we are roughly at the present day and the events of Recall. Monitoring from Watchpoint Gibraltar and increasingly concerned with the state of the world, thinking that a new crisis may be striking, Winston decides to launch a new communication satellite into orbit from Watchpoint Gibraltar's launch pad, the actual objective of the level, and in doing so enables himself to potentially send a recall to all previous Overwatch agents. Watching the news and discussing with Athena as to whether it would be a good idea to directly disobey the Petrus Act. Before he can make a decision or press the button, the facility is under attack from Talon agents and from Reaper. Managing eventually to drive them off, Winston is inspired by the words of his former mentor, Dr. Harold Winston, when he was on the Horizon Lunar Colony, and decides to try and make the world into the kind of one he'd want to see and live in. Activating the recall and seeing all of the messages go out, the final response is from Tracer, saying that it's been too long. In spite of being driven off, Reaper has somehow managed to escape with some data of Overwatch agents, and using this, Talon begin to get to work to try and stop Overwatch from ever coming back. Now, straddling either side of the recall cinematic, a comic series of five comics called London Calling deals with the events of Tracer and her life in London. After the banning of Overwatch and the Petrus Act, Tracer tried a desk job for a while with the RAF. When being inactive didn't suit her, she quit and is now currently in London trying to help, even arresting street thieves where she can. Although she's enjoying spending time with her partner Emily, Tracer is missing the days of Overwatch. In the midst of an Omnic riot, in a case of mistaken identity, she meets Iggy, an Omnic living in the underground of King's Row, who has to obtain components to maintain their power grid by illicit means, since no one in King's Row will sell to Omnics. Finding common ground in their musical taste, London Calling, Tracer and Iggy go to Iggy's apartment, where Tracer meets her flatmates, Lizzie and Lady. Later in the comic, Tracer is harassed by Omnics who don't welcome her presence in the underground. Omnic human relations in King's Row are still tense. Discovering that a human Omnic rally is going to be taking place, Tracer actually gets a private meeting with Mondata. Mondata reflects on her past heroism and remembers her rescuing him during the King's Row uprising and makes a point to Tracer. He hopes that she will continue to try and help Omnics and humans to attain peace with each other even if there would be peril. Tracer agrees that it could be dangerous and hopes that Mondata will look after himself too. She then enters the crowd to hear the Omnic leader. In the midst of the run of five comics, we then go into the events at the Alive animated short, where Tagata Mondata of the Shambhali steps forward in King's Row and advocates for peaceful living and harmony between humans and Omnics. Spotting that something is wrong, Tracer leaps into action but sadly, even though she grapples and fights with Widowmaker above the streets of King's Row, is unable to prevent Widowmaker from assassinating Takata Mondata. In the battle, Tracer does make the effort to recoil out of the way of Widowmaker's bullet in the animated short. Picking up the comics again, Iggy notices this, and in a future conversation with Tracer, professes herself disappointed and believes that maybe Tracer's decision meant that her 
opinions that she's given on supporting Omnix are simply surface level and not deeper. Case, a leader who's not a fan of humans in the Omnic underground, decides to hold a protest at Mondata's death. As the process rapidly escalates, police come forward with sonic cannons to try and disperse the Omnic crowd. Iggy's friend Lady ends up rushing one of the cannons in a bid to stop the police from firing, but ends up taking a pulse right to her face. Due to the proximity and the strength, her systems fail moments later and the Omnic is dead. Due to this violence in the protest, Case attempts to rouse the Omnics of the underground to riot, but his speech to do so is cut short when somebody fires at him and barely misses. A watching Iggy realizes that the shooter is none other than one of Case's accomplices, and she correctly identifies that Case has been trying to incite rebellion through making it out as if his own life was in danger. As the underground becomes chaotic, Tracer and Iggy try to lead some Omnics who want nothing to do with the protests and riots to safety. They are cut off by Case and his men, and Tracer, attempting to defend all of the Omnics, is in a lot of trouble. Her chronal accelerator is still very broken and not fully repaired. Just as things look bleakest, Winston arrives, and together with Iggy, the three succeed in revealing Case's deception and getting the Omnics nearly to safety. However, before fleeing, Case attempts to shoot Iggy, but Tracer, recalling in front of her, takes the bullet for Iggy on this occasion, getting very seriously injured in the process. With a punctured lung and a clipped ventricle, Tracer is touch and go for a while, but with her friends wishing her the best, she pulls through. While she was recovering, Winston assists in repairing the grid of the underground with Iggy, and with her chronal accelerator totally repaired, Tracer and Winston get ready for their next challenge. While Winston is helping Tracer and Iggy in King's Row, other people are slowly answering the recall. In the events of the animated short Rise and Shine, May, nine years after she initially went into cryostasis, is released from Eco Point Antarctica. Due to the downfall of Overwatch and what presumably was a horrific oversight, she discovers, upon waking up, that all of the other scientists in her team have died due to failures in the cryotank equipment. May is devastated, and struggling to know what to do, she wanders the base until discovering that the data that the Eco Point was set up to record has been recording all of these years. Summoning her bravery, May tries to walk out of the base, but with terrible weather conditions and no communication with the outside world, she feels that it's a huge obstacle to overcome. Just at that moment, a signal comes through on the Overwatch emergency frequency. Working out how she can restore and get up to the antenna, May does some inventing with Snowball and manages to receive Winston's recall message, which gives her resolve to set out and try and get back to civilization. At a similar time in the events of the cinematic Honor and Glory, Reinhardt and Brigitta are reflecting on the armor of his master and mentor, Baldrick von Adler. At the castle in Eichenwalde, where Baldrick gave his life to save Reinhardt, Reinhardt reflects on his past, on the foolhardy person he was then, full of bravery, and rushing into battle, not thinking of his team, fighting as an individual. Reinhardt's foolhardiness and bravery get him into a situation where Baldrich has to rescue him from an OR unit. However, the injury that Baldrich sustains means that he's unable to retreat. Sacrificing himself so that Reinhardt and the other men can escape, Baldrich has a glorious last stand with Reinhardt getting the unit to safety before bombers come through and raise the Omnic forces around the castle. At the beginning of the short, Brigitte had asked him why he was going back, why he felt he owed anything to Overwatch. Through reliving his memories, Reinhardt makes it very, very clear why he's going. I have been called. I must answer. Always. It's at about this time that the remaining events of Baptiste's short story, What You Left Behind, occur. Returning to his hometown in Haiti, Baptiste helps one of his childhood friends with a clinic that he has been giving money to all of these years. Having previously avoided a talent ambush by a certain Captain Curva, Baptiste is waylaid in a bar by Nguyen and none other than Malga, 
someone from Baptiste's sole talent unit. The two strong arm him into helping a talent operation in the town. They're going after someone called Bernard Sinclair, mentioned as price gouging meds at the beginning of the story. Sinclair was an analyst within Overwatch who, seeing the corruption and the downfall of the organization, started selling information outside for profit. Yet another factor towards the organization's fall. The mission is successful with Sinclair attempting to try and save his life by offering up news of Winston's recall as well as a list of agents. Nguyen refuses. We know that Reaper, of course, in the events of Recall, got away with a partial list of this already. So Talon would probably already have this. Baptiste is told to execute Sinclair, but instead chooses to try and let the man escape, and escapes from Malga and Nguyen also in the process. Malga comes after Baptiste, who leaves him for potentially dead after detonating a weapon next to him. While reviewing Sinclair's data, Baptiste recognises Angela Ziegler, an inactive agent who he worked with briefly. He decides that he wants to go and warn her and calls in an old favour from a Talon colleague, putting in an encrypted call to none other than Sombra. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the Overwatch world, several of our characters are going about their lives and several pieces of media tell us what they're up to in their story. In the comic Mission Statement, we see Farah and her Helix Strike team responding to a report of the Anubis AI, dubbed a god program by the locals, trying to break out of its containment in the Giza facility. In it, Farah reflects on her past, her relationship with her mother, the state of Egypt, and she learns the meaning of leadership, with her and her squad mates eventually prevailing and securing the facility. During this time, Lucio has emerged as a music star in Brazil, and after his father helped the Vishkar Corporation develop some of their sonic technology before retiring as he didn't like what they were doing with it, Lucio then proceeds to start his fight against the Vishkar's expansion and use of land in Rio. Cassidy, meanwhile, always on the run, has stowed away on a train which comes under attack by what he realises to be Talon trained, if not Talon forces. As Talon appear to be looking for something on the train, Cassidy realises that no people are safe, so he starts fighting the attackers. Realising that Talon will keep chasing until they get what they want, he decides that evicting the item from the train is the best way to secure the safety of its passengers and enjoys a well-deserved cigar as he continues heading south in the direction of Texas and potentially Mexico, maybe to meet up with Sombra, as we see in a future comic. Elsewhere in the world, the Junkers, Roadhog and Junkrat are on their global crime spree that we see in the animated introduction to the two heroes. And this goes into their Going Legit comic, where they're hired for a job by the head of Hyde Global and told to rescue some of their employees who are apparently held hostage by Omnix. Going to a warehouse, the duo arrive to discover that they've been set up and, escaping the ambush, they proceed to go and give Hyde a taste of his own medicine. Okay, welcome to the present, round about 2074 or 2075, that theoretical roughly 60 years in the future we were talking about. We now go to Overwatch's 2014 Museum Cinematic, or the Overwatch Unveil Cinematic. Two kids are exploring the Overwatch Museum, trying to understand the history of the famous organization. However, their visit becomes a little larger than life when suddenly Widowmaker and Reaper invade, trying to steal the Doomfist. The two are scared, but trying to be heroes themselves, Winston and Tracer then arrive and a fight ensues. Reaper breaks Winston's glasses, and that sends him into a primal rage, beating back the two Talon agents and causing them to flee. Meanwhile, deep in the south on the Black Forest of Germany, a lone bastion unit, a relic of the first Omnic Crisis, is for some reason reactivated. Showing some curiosity in the world around it, the bastion unit's previous programming kicks in and it goes off on its original mission, to attack a nearby city. Whereas it had previously shown curiosity in a little bird that had sat on it and potentially woken it up, the Bastion unit goes into a flashback of the horrors of the area in the first Omnic Crisis, where we see Crusaders and German infantry trying to beat off an endless Omnic attack. With the little bird landing on the unit again, the Bastion unit seems to struggle as it tries to work out between its programming and having its own free will. Eventually, its free will takes over. And if you can describe it as such, the Bastion unit and its bird then go off into the forest. 
Han So, in the meantime, ever since he thought he had killed his brother, has been wandering the world as a ronin, trying to make amends. He made his return to Shimada Castle to pay his respects with incense and prayers. Before he can pay his respects, an intruder appears. Fighting the intruder, Hanzo unleashes his Shimada dragon, but is amazed when the intruder not only manages to defeat him, but turns around and uses his own dragon back at Hanzo. It is then that it is revealed that the intruder is in fact Genji in his new cyberized body. Hanzo does not recognize his brother and wants to learn more. Genji interrupts him, however, and says that he came only for one purpose. The world is changing once again, Hanzo, and it's time to pick a side. In what used to be the Shimada stronghold of Kanazaka, meanwhile, Ase Yamagami has written a letter to her husband, talking about the increase in the Hashimoto clan's oppressive rule and extortion of the local people. Asa reports that this has got to such an extent that there is a gang, apparently of vigilantes, who are attacking and disrupting the gang at every turn. Asa is having to work for the Hashimoto because Toshiro, her husband, is being held as hostage by the gang. Her letter also implies concern for her daughter, Kiriko, who she hopes doesn't get caught up in the violence. Meanwhile, Viali, the head of Talon, tries to form a collaboration with Katia Volskaya of Volskaya Industries. When she refuses to hear him out, Viali's temper snaps and he orders her to be executed, sending a Talon strike team of Reaper, Widowmaker and Sombra. In the events of infiltration, we see the three at work in combat. Widowmaker is just about to take the lethal shot when a security alarm goes off, causing Volskaya to be taken to safety. Reaper dives in, fights against a mech, and leaves Sombra space to go and chase Volskaya. After cornering her in her office after an action-packed chase, Sombra offers Volskaya a deal. She shows her some blackmail material of Volskaya taking technology, it seems, from a mysterious Omnic, and says that she wouldn't want to have Sombra as an enemy and maybe Sombra could be her friend instead. Knowing that the company supplying Russia's defense mechs is collaborating with Omnics would ruin Volskaya and she agrees to do whatever Sombra says. Saying she'll be in touch, Sombra cloaks out. At the very end of the animated short in her office, Volskaya calls in Zarya, and in an attempt to follow up on the incident that had just occurred, the comic Searching details Zarya trying to hunt down Sombra and bring her in. Zarya is shown traveling all around the world before she ends up in Numbani and pairs up with an Omnic hacker called Link-17. Having to overcome her hatred and initial distrust of Omnix, Zarya has of course been fighting them in Russia for many years, Link-17 helps her pinpoint Sombra to Dorado. Ultimately, asking around and finding Alejandra, who claims to know Sombra, they finally manage to find the hacker in a warehouse. Sombra disables Lynx, reveals Volskaya's secret to Zarya, and then explodes the surroundings. This gives Zarya a decision. She can either save Lynx or pursue Sombra and chooses to save Lynx, having come to have some kind of begrudging respect for the Omnic. Returning to Russia and reporting in, Zarya says that she will no longer work with Volskaya, although agrees to keep the secret that she knows safe for the good of the country and morale. During this time, we also get an insight into the Omnic warfare fought in Korea with Shooting Star, Diva's animated short. Omnics coming from the sea in Korea and attacking on a regular basis, adapting as they did so, eventually meant that the Mecha Force, which was automated drones at the time, could not work. As a result, the Korean government looked to gamers and pilots with great reactions to pilot mechs manually, and thus modern Mecha was born. In Shooting Star, we see Diva as the only active pilot, accompanied by her friend Dai Hyun, shoulder the weight of responsibility on her own and feel that she can't take help. As ultimately she manages to almost beat off an attack, she realizes that the only way that she can truly save everyone is by, is by acknowledging when she needs some help and being able to receive it. With Daihyun triggering her mecha's self-destruct, Diva manages to defeat the wave of Omnics, however injuring herself by dropping a long distance into the sea in the process. Having recovered and with the TV belting out propaganda that Diva was absolutely fine, an injured Diva and her friend repair her mech deciding to go for the nano cola and snacks rather than all of the fancy lifestyle that Diahun would probably prefer. 
Having swung around the whole Overwatch world, we now return, believe it or not, to Cairo to pick up in Angela Ziegler or Mercy's story of Valkyrie. At the beginning of the story, Angela Ziegler is working on a humanitarian mission and she reflects deeply on her past, both her first meeting with Morrison, her recruitment into Overwatch and what she's been up to since leaving it, as well as the legacy of Overwatch, particularly in Egypt, where it caused a lot of problems and is not really welcome, even today. Morrison and Amari join her and she tries to provide some basic medical care before Talon attack. With the Anubis facility under attack by Talon, Morrison and Anna say that innocent civilians are caught in the crossfire. And with that, Ziegler feels that she has no choice but to strap on her Valkyrie suit once more. Attempting to save a girl named Hanan and her brother, Ziegler nearly gets killed, getting them to safety due to rubble falling on her. After helping other civilians injured after the attack occurred, she's invited by Amari and Morrison to join them, chasing Reyes and Talon. But Mercy refuses, saying that she might have other priorities. The Reflections comic at the end of 2016 in the holiday season gave us a story of Tracer trying to find the perfect Christmas present for her partner, Emily. However, it also gave us a look at where most of the cast of Overwatch were at this point in the timeline. To call out some highlights, we see that Lucio was advertising a New Year's Eve concert in King's Row. Genji was with Zenyatta in Nepal, writing a letter with what looks like a feather pen or a quill. And we also see Mercy set against a field hospital in a sunny or desert area, opening an envelope and reading a letter which seems to also have a feather. Now, considering that Genji's nickname was Sparrow, perhaps this is a little message from Genji to Mercy. We also see Cassidy passed out with alcohol in a bar in Dorado, and Sombra seems to be perfectly fine at the other end of the bar. Now, if you went into Castillo deathmatch level, then you would see this scene played out with the empty shot glasses and the hat of McCree on the bar, actually in game. We also see Widowmaker visiting the grave of her husband, Gerard Lacroix, which makes some wonder if her mental conditioning from Talon is wearing off. And we also see Reaper. Standing in the shadows, he somewhat ominously is watching a seemingly happy family walking in the rain, with Winston hosting Emily and Tracer for what looks to be a Christmas dinner at Watchpoint Gibraltar. At least some people are having a bit of a respite in the Overwatch world this holiday season. Potentially up to a year after the events of the museum, a Swedish village is shocked at reported sightings of a bastion unit. Torbjorn arrives in the area and, even though the townspeople are worried and wish to destroy it, ask them to let him deal with it. With the local police chief in tow, Torbjorn examines the unit and works out that something is a little bit strange about it. It is not using standard bastion programming. He should know since he designed it. Making sure that the local policemen who, slightly worried, wish to destroy the unit don't do so, Torbjorn somehow persuades Bastion to come with him and heads off with the Omnic Destination Unknown. Meanwhile, in the very popular Masquerade comic, Akande Ogundimu or Doomfist decides that the time is right to break out of the Helix facility that he has been imprisoned in. Collected by Reaper and informed of current events, Ogundimu decides to head to none other than Maximilian's Casino in Monaco. Gambling a little to get the lay of the land, Doomfist and Max's conversation is rudely interrupted when they are assaulted by what appear to be Viali's men. The leader of Talon is not pleased to see Doomfist out of prison. Deciding that enough is enough, Doomfist, accompanied by Reaper, Sombra and Widowmaker, heads to Venice. As he knows, a meeting of the Talon in a council will be occurring there. Disguising themselves in very fancy dress, the squad infiltrate and take out several Talon guards, leading Doomfist's path to the inner council clear. He actually meets with Viali, who says that it's nothing personal and that the two have simply very different approaches. Viali prefers money and Doomfist is more ideologically driven. Their debate is settled, with Doomfist throwing Viali off a bridge, and he then goes to the Talon inner council, ominously saying, with Moira, Sanjay Korpal and others looking on, that they have a war to start. With Doomfist in command of Talon, he now looks to try and recover his prized weapon. 
over in Numbani, Ifi Oladeli is a young inventor who recently, through her plans and genius, received a grant from the Adawe Foundation. Trying to decide what project she will start with her genius grant, when she's due to go on a family holiday, Ifi witnesses the aftermath of Doomfist attacking Numbani, stealing the Doomfist, and leaving the Numbani airport in tatters, with the OR units that were meant to defend the city being inadequate and not up to the task. Ifi decides that she needs to build something that will defend her city, and uses her grant to try and upgrade an old OR-15 unit to make it better than the ones that she saw crushed by Doomfist. The Omnic is named Arisa, and in the Hero of Numbani novel by award-winning author Nikki Drayden, we discover the trials and tribulations of Ifi and Arisa as she attempts to get Arisa in a state to defend her city and bridge the relations between Omnics and humans also. As Doomfist's pressure on Numbani becomes ever more serious, Ifi actually meets Lucio. He appears in Numbani for a concert, although Ifi is concerned that Doomfist will strike. When Doomfist attacks Lucio's concert, Arisa, Ifi, and Lucio all work together, defeating Talon and driving Doomfist away. At the end of the novel, Ifi's class is interrupted by Arisa breaking down the door and saying that she is here and that people are in trouble and that they need to fly away. Although in lore it's not been confirmed who this is right now, Sojourn is mentioned a lot as being Ifi's inspiration in the novel from the old Overwatch cartoons that apparently used to be on TV in universe. So it's quite possible that Arisa and Ifi could be receiving some kind of Overwatch call up. Meanwhile, in India, Vishkar Corporation have accidentally damaged a sacred statue of Aurora, the first sentient Omnic who sacrificed herself apparently to grant sentience to all others. She is revered particularly by the Shambhali and indeed many Omnics of a more spiritual persuasion. Fearing a PR disaster, none other than Satya Viswani, Sumetra, is dispatched by Vishkar to the local town to try and sort things out. Meeting none other than Zinyata, who is supervising affairs, Symmetra spends, a s Symmetra spends a lot of time with Zenyata and in the temple building, learning about the importance of Aurora to Omnix and also about the concept of perfection. Symmetra is on the spectrum, it is discussed even since her first comic in 2016, and a facet of that manifests in her character in that she is very, very detail-oriented and feels quite uncomfortable if things are not precisely in the order that she likes. Teaching her of the Japanese aesthetic philosophy called wabi-sabi, Zenyata says that imperfection should be embraced and appreciated. And talking about kintsugi, golden joinery, the Japanese art of mending broken ceramics with gold. Discovering something about her own imperfect perfections, Symmetra proceeds to repair the temple and the statue with her own hard light form of kintsugi, delighting Zenyata and the locals and giving Sanjay Korpal something to think about. Now, perhaps from his meeting with Sombra, we see Cassidy in the events of Reunion, the animated short, back at the cafe on Route 66. As an explosion rends the air, Cassidy walks out to see his old gang, led by Ash, pulling a heist on a US military transport train. The gang have gone through the wreckage and found various weaponry and ammunition, but Cassidy's attention is drawn to a particularly fancy crate as its ashes. As the two catch up and reminisce, Cassidy says that all he wants is the crate and that Ash and the gang can have the rest. Ash opens the crate and is intrigued enough by the contents that she wants to duel Cassidy for it. Cassidy and the gang are in a standoff. As the clock strikes, well, what other time but high noon, the two begin fighting and in the resulting fracas, Cassidy comes off best. Tying up the gang and sending them away on a cart, Cassidy then opens the crate and using a chip that he was flicking around on the table at the beginning of the short, he activates what turns out to be Echo, Dr. Mina Liao's last and greatest creation. Echo catches up with Cassidy, she notices that he has lost his arm in the time that she has been deactivated and McCree gives her a mission. He says that he's been recalled, but they want me, but really? They need you. Last but not least, as Echo asks what Cassidy is going to do, he says that he has some unfinished business and, just like a cowboy, drives off into the sunset with Ash's bike. 
As events in the Overwatch world now start to gather pace, the lore switches to looking at what the new blood of Overwatch are up to and how Cassidy will go around recruiting the next generation. Before Cassidy set out for the events of Reunion, he received a note saying, Sharma, time to talk, and ends up in Cairo, Egypt. Reuniting with Anna Amari, the two catch up on old times before Anna asks if Cassidy is going to rejoin Overwatch. Anna says that it's time for her generation to move on, and that they don't want them to repeat the mistakes of the past. Before they can talk further, the two are interrupted by Talon agents. Fighting their way out, Cassidy notices that Anna is now disabling people and not killing them. Anna tells Cassidy that she's had a change of heart over the years and that he too can change. He didn't have the opportunities to show who he could truly be when he was in Blackwatch. As Anna looked out for him, Anna now wants Cassidy to look out for the new generation and lead them. Finally, giving him some intelligence data that she's gathered, including potential targets and threats, as well as new recruits, Cassidy sets out, and his first person on his list, in Cairo, Faria Amari herself. Following some Helix security officers flying through Cairo, Cassidy links up with and finds Anna's daughter Farah. She's been captaining a clear-up operation on some talent agents. Farah is surprised to see Cassidy, but she's not overjoyed to see him all with the message that he brings. Apparently, Reinhardt, Brigitte and Tracer have all sent Farah the recall. Given the daily violence in Cairo and increasing rest beyond Egypt's borders, Faria feels her duty is to stay with Helix and that she's most needed right where she is now. Cassidy senses that something else is keeping her, and saying that her mother regretted stopping her joining Overwatch, he steps aside as Anna comes to see Farah. As the two struggle with their reunion, Anna has sent a letter to Farah, as we know in her origin trailer, saying that she's still alive but Anna has been pretty much undercover and underground since. They are once again under attack by Talon troops. The three work together to fight their way to safety, with Farah taking the lead as it's her local turf. Watching how slickly her mother and Cassidy draw fire and movements of Talon, Farah wonders if she could achieve more with different help apart from Helix. As an RPG is launched at Farah, she cleans up the rest of the Talon troops with a rocket barrage but she's injured in the process. Anna patches her up, and while she's doing so, apologizes for keeping her daughter from what she thought was the wrong life path for her. In spite of all their differences, and in spite of the awkward reunion, Anna tells her that she should go with Cole so that she can realize her full potential. She is not doing it, in Anna's opinion, with Helix. Eventually, the two reconcile, and Faria flies away, saying that she has to make up her mind. As Cassidy leaves to head north, he is followed in the shadows by Baptiste. Travelling now through Romania in New Blood comic episode 3, Baptiste attempts to trail Cassidy but feels that he knows that he's being followed. Cassidy manages to lose him and Baptiste is then ambushed by Cassidy as he attempts to give chase. The two fight as Cassidy believes Baptiste to still be talent from his tactics with Baptiste using his exo boots to slam Cole into the ceiling before Cole eventually prevails. Sharing his story in brief, Baptiste explains that Talon are hunting him and that he wants to help Overwatch. Having found an Overwatch agent hit list on some agents that he defeated in his short story, Baptiste wanted to warn Mercy in particular, who he'd previously met and worked with, by heading to Cairo. Having found Cassidy, Baptiste offers him the list before Talon attack. Working together, at least until they survive, the two dodge the agents and head for a train. Baptiste is left behind by Cassidy, fighting until surrounded and seemingly fighting until his death, before Cassidy returns to save him, allowing Baptiste to escape. Cassidy is impressed by Baptiste's bravery and tells him to lie low while he runs some background checks on him. Cassidy harks back to the time where he was given a chance by none other than Gabriel Reyes and says that if Baptiste wants this chance, then he can understand why. If he checks out, Cassidy will be in touch. And as the train reaches the Russian border, Cassidy heads to his next recruit. In the fourth comic of New Blood, we catch up with Zarya, having returned to her military unit in Siberia after her special mission for Katya Volskaya, Zarya is on the front lines fighting, in the same place her father died defending. 
Defending her hometown, family and friends was what caused Zaria to give up her Olympic weightlifting career. The local Omnium is attacking the surrounding area and churning out Omnics en masse again. Previously, her family and friends would mine the local area for metal. Now they strip it of metal to try and starve the Omnium of the materials it needs. Asked for her autograph by a recruit, Zarya suddenly feels a war weariness after a patrol. However, she keeps her promise and gives the recruit her autograph to keep morale up after they get back. An alarm then sounds at the base for a general retreat that will leave Zarya's hometown of Novonskoy to the surrounding Omnic Horde. Zarya requests permission from her commanding officer to go and protect her family, but before she can even utter the phrase, the commander gives her permission to leave her unit and do what she needs to. As she leaves the base, Zarya is offered a ride by none other than Cassidy, turning up in a truck. Recognising him and telling him to leave, Zarya says that this is not his fight, and Cole retorts by saying that he goes where he's needed. Drawing all of the Omnics to her, Zarya resolves to buy her people the time they need to escape, and as her barrier fails, Cassidy soars into the fight to save her with his truck. The two team up against the Omnic threat, with Zarya projecting a barrier onto Cassidy before unleashing an almighty graviton surge, allowing her time to find her family. Looking to move them to safety, she's impressed, as Cassidy has already cleared the path of Omnix, and when he admires her bravery and asks her to join him, she's very quick to accept. At the end of the comic, Zarya, Sasha to her family, is standing with her family, all of them looking at a datapad, talking about a null sector attack on Paris, leading us into the events of Zero Hour. In the events of the cinematic that was used to announce Overwatch 2, Winston, May and Tracer respond to a call for help from Paris, where Null Sector has launched an all-out assault on the city. Before the team land, Winston reminisces on how different things are now compared to his Overwatch family of the past. As May asks him if they have enough people for this, Winston tries to fill her with confidence, but then quietly says under his voice that if anyone was going to answer the call, now would be a good time. As the team land, they initially meet with some success, but sheer force of numbers starts to overwhelm them before a titan Null Sector mech walks around the corner and cuts their dropship in two. This is far too much firepower for the three erstwhile Overwatch agents. With May being injured in the process, Winston prepares to sacrifice himself in order to give Tracer, May and the civilians time to escape. As Winston faces down the giant Omnic, suddenly the cavalry arrives. Genji protects Winston by deflecting a huge titan round back at the monstrous mech. Echo flies in, providing a distraction. Mercy comes from on high to heal May, and Reinhardt and Brigitte protect the team while they come up with a plan. Using May's cryotechnology combined with a pulse bomb, new Overwatch make a Hail Mary play, with Tracer just delivering the bomb in time to shatter the titan to pieces. And as snow falls with the remnants of the Omnic scattered around them, the civilians have one question. Is Overwatch back? Winston has a simple answer. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Moving away from the events of Zero Hour, Azari and family are watching the aftermath on the news. So too, over in Busan, Diva and the Mecha Squad are also keeping abreast of current events. Asking if they should contact the Overwatch agents and share intel, Captain Myung says they've been forbidden from contact and should focus on Korean defense. Petitioning her captain again in private, Diva gets sympathy from the mecha commander before all mecha units are scrambled as a large-scale Omnic attack turns out to be Null Sector. In a similar manner to the Paris attack, mecha threatened to be overwhelmed. With Diva's suggestion of attacking the command ship being denied, the squad attempt to protect civilian evacuations until several of them are out of action. As things look bleak, an unidentified dropship joins the fray. It's Cassidy's new blood recruits dropping in, announcing themselves as Overwatch. Farah, Baptiste, Zarya and Cassidy all get into battle and turn the tide, buying Mecha time to regroup, repair, and then the joint squads together repel the Null Sector threat. As cheering crowds escort the Overwatch dropship to Mecha base, D.Va is given permission by her captain to join Overwatch after all as their mecha liaison. Boarding the transport, Cassidy reflects on the fact that the new blood have got the fire that he used to have 
and gives the instruction to head for Gibraltar, as apparently they're already late. As the new Overwatch crew all travel to Gibraltar to presumably meet up, we cast our minds back to Kanazaka in Japan. As the Summer Fireworks Festival draws to an end in Hanamura, Kiriko Yamagami and her friends Ryota, Nobuta and Sakura decide to strike back at the Hashimoto clan who terrorise Kanazaka by attempting to disrupt a weapon shipment at the nearest port. Channeling her family's ancestral connection with the fox spirit, Kiriko and her friends make short and non-lethal work of the guards. Kiriko's grandmother tended the local fox shrine and through her Kiriko has a connection to the spirit that guards her still today. Ryota suggests blowing up the guns they found with fireworks. Kiriko worries that the group are going to go down a violent path and starts telling an old Shimada folk story. An enemy clan attack the Shimadas and their townspeople, setting their orchards ablaze and then leaving the townspeople for dead. Lying in wait around the blazing orchards, the gang assumed that the Shimada would rush to save their assets and not their people, thinking that the Shimada thought the same way as they did. The Shimada clan chose to care for and look after their people first, then moved with the people who were still able to fight and recovered to reclaim the orchards. As a result, they vastly outnumbered their foe. Understanding Kiriko's point that any collateral damage caused could hurt their cause and cause way more harm to the innocent, their gang instead decide to act like a force that strikes from the shadows, a force with no face, one they can't explain, like ghosts. Yoka. Somewhere around this time, in her own new animated short, we see Kiriko returning to her home in Kanazaka, complete with donuts for dinner. She greets a man maintaining the building she knows well, Mr. Yoshida, and finds out that he's brought his granddaughter to work with him. The granddaughter, very excited to see and familiar with Kiriko, has some difficulty or is unable to speak, so Kiriko rather coolly communicates with her in sign language. Given advance warning that her mother has come to visit and has brought the vacuum cleaner, Kiriko goes into her flat and meets her mum, Asa Yamagami. Wearing the fox mask that she was given by Mr. Yoshida's granddaughter, Kiriko has a scolding from her mum. She's concerned, she doesn't want her just having donuts for dinner, and apparently people in the building have been robbed recently. Asa is concerned that Kiriko has moved out of home, is worried that Kiriko has stopped training with her, and feels that Kanazaka is falling apart. Kiriko says to her mother that she believes in the fox spirit, she's protected, and it'll even help balance her blood sugar, as well as block bullets. Sounds a pretty handy spirit. Asa is still worried, and says that she believes faith may be not enough to keep Kiriko safe. Kiriko says that she's stronger than her mother thinks. We then cut to the Hashimoto clan, with some thugs coming and roughing up Mr. Yoshida, as apparently his son owes them a lot of money. The Hashimoto clan gang thugs wearing Oni masks and showing the welcome return as well of Pompadour Man, much beloved Overwatch background character, seem to be looking to harm Mr. Yoshida and Kiriko, using the very techniques that her mother has little faith in, teleports out of the room. In a nod to martial arts films, it is officially face kicking time. Omnix gets stabbed, Kiriko shows off her wide variety of skills, including teleporting and her ability with her kunai, before in the fracas, Mr. Yoshida actually gets shot. Kiriko uses her very powerful, clearly healing Fuda to heal Mr. Yoshida, and then moves the girl back to him with her teleport as well. Calling on the power of the fox spirit and shrine, Kiriko then uses her Kitsune Rush, says Kanazaka is under her protection, and inspires both Yoshida and his granddaughter with a mean axe throw, doing serious damage to Pompadour Man's hairdo, to drive away the thugs. Checking Yoshida and his granddaughter are okay, the granddaughter is growing up fast according to Kiriko and says that she's okay because her granddad is okay, Kiriko heads back home, and Asa, her mum, has been watching the whole time. The two reconcile. Kiriko agrees that maybe she shouldn't have stopped training and maybe she should move home for a bit. And Asa also says that maybe she shouldn't have dodged Kiriko's donut habit too harshly. Although grandma is gone, Kiriko's mum is overwhelmed with emotion, saying that her baby is a superhero. Kiriko's identity is now, of course, confirmed to the Hashimoto clan if it wasn't before with the raid in Kiriko's short story that her gang made. So remember that, of course, Asa has been pressed into service by the Hashimoto clan because Kiriko's dad 
Asa's husband. Toshiro Yamagami has been taken captive by the Hashimoto clan, and Kiriko's mother has been working for them as an enforcer to keep Toshiro safe. This, now that the Hashimoto clan know who Kiriko is, presumably puts the whole family, including the held hostage Toshiro, in a lot of danger. What will Kiriko do next? And as we see what Kiriko and her crew will get up to next, with Cassidy and the New Blood joining Winston and the team in Gibraltar, new heroes and villains emerging around the world, and the Null Sector, Talon, and many more threats in this second global crisis as yet unanswered, Overwatch, well, it's needed more than ever. Where will the team go next? I can't wait to find out. Well, that's 60 years or more of Overwatch timeline and a summary over eight years of all of the Overwatch lore, story and world. I hope you enjoyed. If you like this video, please throw a like, subscribe and comment with your favourite part of the lore and story below what you're looking forward to in Overwatch 2. It means a lot and really helps me and my channel. If you'd like to see more Overwatch lore or in-depth lore and gaming content like this, please check the playlists here for over eight years worth of Overwatch content and more games besides. If you'd like to buy me a coffee, there's of course Super Thanks here on YouTube, or visit my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash hammy. It really helps make the videos possible. Big thanks to all of the patrons who have supported me over the last six years here, and all of you who have watched videos and helped make my content possible. If you've watched or subscribed, you help so much too. Cheers for tuning in. I've been Hammy. Take it easy.